This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. It is Thursday. It is the 31st of March, 2022, and this is your Create Your Own Life show. I hope you guys are having a great week. Um, We have a really, really great episode in store for you today, as um, by popular demand, um, a lot of people wanted another episode on blockchain and, um, you know, kind of how this whole fits in with the world economy, as well as, um, you know, how it deals with sanctions and things like that. So, I brought in on my really good friend today, Alexander Lores, um, and he is the founder of the latest block.com. And he's also the director of blockchain market, market research for quantumeconomics.io. And uh, we have a really, really great conversation around blockchain, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, um, you know, what those are, what they have to do with. Um, and we also talk a little bit about some things I was concerned about because I think one of the biggest concerns I had is, you know, the federal government wants to know where you spend all your money so they have the ability to turn it on and off. And uh, Alex tells us why he doesn't think that is possible with blockchain. We also talk about how the government's looking to regulate it, what, how they're approaching it. We're also looking at uh, the IMF, the, the World Bank, how they're dealing with it as well. And we're taking a look at Russian sanctions and, and how this kind of fits into the whole thing as well. Um, this is a really, really all-encompassing um, conversation with Alex. Um, we touched on a lot of really, really great points, and I'm, I'm so grateful for him to uh, to take this time out and chat with us today. Um, we had to do a little bit of work to the audio um, because uh, his volume was a little bit low, but I think we handled it, and, and uh, I'm really excited with kind of the, the final product we got for you guys. So you guys are absolutely going to love this episode, and I think you're going to really leave with a lot of food for thought and, and asking some new questions, which to me, anytime you, you hear a great interview or a great conversation, if you can leave with new insight that leaves you looking for more information on certain topics and asking questions differently, I, I feel like we've done our job. So uh, that's our, our interview today is with uh, my good friend, Alexander Lores. I've known him a very long time. He's a very cool dude. And uh, I'm really excited to get a chance to, to, to chat with him about this. And I think you guys are going to enjoy the conversation. So before we get into this conversation, though, I just want to shout out a couple great companies that made this episode possible to our friends over at MyPillow, who right now we're offering you up to 66% off of select products. If you just use my promo code, which is C-Y-O-L over at MyPillow.com, up to 66% off of select products. Also, shout out to our friends over at Audible, who right now are offering you a free audiobook download and a free month of their service. I just finished up The Great Reset by Glenn Beck. If you want to grab that book or any other book for free, Courtesy of Audible, just head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. Also, guys, if you have not checked out the video version of the show, let's say you're listening on the podcast right now, head over to Rumble or YouTube as we are really pushing hard over there and, and trying to create a you know better piece of quality content for you guys. So I, I hope you're checking that out. Give us a subscribe over there. If you're listening to the podcast version, uh, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen. And uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, do us a favor, leave us a five-star rating and review um, because that does help us to, to kind of get more traction and, and, you know, make a bigger impact out there. All right, everyone, without further ado, let's get into this good in- this uh, interview with my good friend, Alexander Lores, about blockchain, world economics, and how it fits in with sanctions. All right, let's get into the episode. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for today's episode because we are both fully caffeinated and uh, and ready for this podcast interview. I have I have my good friend Alex Lores with us today. And uh, he is the founder at thelatestblock.com as well as the director of blockchain market research for quantumeconomics.io. Alex, thanks for taking some time out today, man. It's an honor to be here, Jeremy. Great to finally be on the podcast and great to see you again, man. Yeah, so I, I really want to talk about um, all things blockchain and crypto today because I, I think the major misunderstood people have first and foremost is they think that when they hear it, they think it's just money. 
And 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 I think the thing that's very cool about blockchain technology is I think there's there's actually so many more things we can do with it than just money. There's so many things it opens up. But I guess for you, what kind of pulled you into this whole world, man? That's a great question. I mean, kind of where it all started. I like to take something from its its beginning and you know go from there. Obviously, it started yeah. in, uh, you know right after the financial crisis, uh, you know, 20, 2007, You know, there's a whole situation with banks were giving out, you know, essentially fraudulent mortgages, people who couldn't afford it and tricking them into the fact that it would be okay. And then, you know, that eventually collapsed. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a number of, I can't remember the exact number, somewhere around 5 trillion or some amount of money in people's retirement account was was wiped out. And then big banks, uh, you know, instead of going to jail, uh, they in fact got bailed out and used those bailouts to give their CEOs massive bonuses and none of them went to jail. Uh, and, wow. and they could have at least done something else with the money, but they, they have, you know, the, the trust in centralized financial institutions, centralized trusted third parties uh, hit an all time low because mm-hmm. we have trusted these banks to safeguard our money and uh, wiped it out. And they got n- nothing happened to them showing that they were just, kind of in control of their part of the pie, no matter what happens to you. So Satoshi- I think that's the really interesting part is people don't realize that. Um, and I, I, I can't even tell you the number of times I've said this in the show. You know, we talk about, um, you know, the U.S. Treasury actually gets its its money power from from the Federal Reserve, which is neither, neither federal nor holds any reserves. They just kind of basically add to their, their ledger. They buy some bonds from the U.S. and all of a sudden money exists. So I, I think it's quite interesting that this whole system is, is is set up just to you know basically keep the banks from losing any money. Yeah, it's pretty wild, and it's the centralized holder that holds all the cards. You know, it's like mm-hmm. it, you have all your trust in them. You don't have an alternative. There's no competition. Uh, if you go to Wendy's, you don't like it. You can always go to McDonald's, but you don't have that choice in the banking system, or you didn't until sure. Bitcoin uh, was released. So you have this idea of centralized central institutes uh, that control everything and they use it to protect themselves as a first priority, no matter how many people suffer. So October 31st, 2008, this thing called the Bitcoin white paper gets released by, uh, you know, a pseudonymous person, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, which is a person or a group of people and their identity is still a mystery. And uh, it's kind of a cool aspect of it, but they created a peer to peer, uh, financial network that also has, you know, uh, a currency, a digital currency. It doesn't have any corporation or government body or central bank that controls it. It has exact rules. Uh, It's maintained by a decentralized computer network over the internet. And uh, nobody can go and like print another 10 million Bitcoin if they need it. Uh, So Mm -hmm. the abuses that you've seen, especially you, you know, since 2008, it got pretty, you know, let me go back. 1971, the U.S. goes off the gold standard. President, <laughs> Thanks, Richard Nixon. Yeah, Richard Nixon. Um, <laughs> you know, and if you look at the speech, it's a temporary, you know, the phrase, uh, nothing's as permanent as a temporary government program. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, like uh, is that like inflation that's transitory? That's right. <laughs> so it temporarily took the U.S. off the gold standard, of course, never went back. At that point, uh, at least the Federal Reserve existed. There were central banks that governments printed money, but they at least were forced to, in some way, connect it to uh, an asset, right? They had some force mm-hmm. to at least tie it to gold to some degree and that at least get approval and say, hey, we're, we're this far out to lunch. Then it just became adding ones and zeros in the computer. And then uh, in 2007, 2008, there was monetary stimulus that kind of started taking off 2020. 2021 got even more out of control. I think one figure, there's different ways to look at it. I think 40% of the currency uh, the U.S. has ever printed, it was printed in the last two years. Oh, okay. So that so the so there's um, the Federal Reserve has what's called M1 and M2 money supply. Yeah. Uh, and the M2 money supply, which is the one you can track. Um, I don't. Do you know Jerry Feta by any chance? Uh, no. Okay. So he turned he turned me on to looking at this, and it was. Uh, Forty percent of all of the M two money supply that's in in circulation now um, was printed after March or not March after May first of of last year. Yes. So that's kind of wild when you look at it inflation wise. Yeah. And then those same central bankers saying you know inflation is going to be transitory. 
uh, and then saying, well, actually, inflation maybe is not going to be so bad, and then actually, inflation is good, you know, and, and all this, you know, uh, BS, right? I actually wrote a series of blogs called the No BS Look at the U.S. Economy because it's just like, yeah, just lying to people, and it's it's not even. You know, historically, generally, politicians try to lie in some sort of framework, like we're just Republicans or we're Democrats or something. <laughs> There's no, no one's even pretending to be loyal to anything at this point. It's like I, I like to call them the the Uniparty because that's 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 really what they what they are at this point. Or, or Alex, are you familiar with something called modern monetary theory? Yeah, where uh, basically a lot of our transactions are run by debt. Yes, and in order for you know. Um, Basically, what happens is they they do inflation to make make it so it's easier to pay off debt, and and you know governments can operate off a lot more debt, and basically our economy is just fueled by debt now. Yeah. And if we were still on a gold standard, like we we couldn't do modern monetary theory. It's just not possible because something would be backing it up and holding it to a finite number. Yeah, and that's the beauty of Bitcoin because uh, that that train is you know if that system could be implemented in an in a rational way, that that train left the station a long time ago. Um, and yeah. Bitcoin is both decentralized, it's not controlled by a central bank or a government that can just change its mind when they have a problem to solve. Uh, the second thing is that uh, it is a finite in number. There's only going to be 21 mm -hmm. million Bitcoin ever created. Uh, there's about, I think, 18, 19 million created now. In actual fact, like 3 million has been lost there's only really going to be 17 million that can be bought or sold. So it's finite. In How does it get lost? I, I haven't heard that before. Three million was lost. Okay, so uh, there's a couple of ways you can hold Bitcoin. Uh, the more mm -hmm. kind of uh, traditional orthodox way would be to have it on a private wallet, which uh, really is just an address. It could be on a flash drive. You could even write it down on a piece of paper to access it later. You have an address. Oh, gosh. If the address is public. The address is like your home address. Then there's mm -hmm. a key, which is like literally your key into your front door. So anyone can see your address. They can see kind of what you've been doing, but they can't get your money unless you have uh, your private key, which is um, there's different ways to put it together. Usually it's like 12 or 18 random words, 24 words, whatnot. Like you have that, uh, you can access your money. So, of course, if you lose mm -hmm. that, uh, you can lose your money. Um the creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, is basically disappeared from the earth, whether they were another person went into hiding or whether they're deceased. Uh, no one knows. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that, there's that. He had a chunk of Bitcoin. Um, that, that's one thing that's worried me a little bit, that like we like the the anonymity of who is this guy? Like like the thing that concerns me is like I don't want it to like one day be like, you thought I was Shigatashi Asamoto. I'm actually Klaus Schwab. Like that. Like that's the thing that worries me, man. <laughs> I've heard that. You know, here's what we know, right? Um, that the, you know, at the time, I, th I think it was very obvious that when Bitcoin was smaller, uh, you know, the kind of powers that be uh, very much were against Bitcoin. Now they've, I think, softened their approach, not because they're pro Bitcoin, but they realize it's too big. To, to break at this point. It's kind of like Chase Bank. You might hate it. Yeah. But they're like, well, the government, you know, whatever they wanted to do in 2008, whatever Democrats that campaign on the basis of, you know, stopping big corporations from abusing their power, uh, they didn't have the ability to issue any penalties on them. So there's a point where it got too big, like, well, it's going to hurt more people. So let's help the banks. And then the banks mm. abuse their power. So I don't see that happening with Bitcoin. But basically, my point is that. Uh, it's become too big for them to kill also because it's decentralized because mm -hmm. one banker can say we're going to cancel Bitcoin and then, you know, their opponents are going to approve it. The only country that's banned Bitcoin really effectively is China, which mm. in a way kind of opens, you know, democratic countries to go, wait a minute, maybe it's not so bad, right? If China right. is banning Bitcoin, they're a totalitarian autocratic government. They don't want democratic money. They want money that... Uh, they can use to increase their surveillance on citizens. They want money that they can just push a button and wipe out, which is basically, mm -hmm. as we saw in Canada, pretty much uh, yeah. what we have now. But this would be the next you know, level. China's got a uh, central bank digital currency, which is kind of like Bitcoin, but the opposite. Like they take the same principles of you know, digital and they make it totally centralized. 
in their central bank to the point where the government can be like, well, you know, your your social credit score is low. You criticized the government last week, so we're going to you know empty your bank account as punishment. So mm-hmm. that's like the dystopian end. Bitcoin is you got it. You can have it on a wallet where nobody can stop you from transacting. Um, there's of course limits. That's, that's a really interesting concept too, because I, I, I guess like um, let let's get into a little bit of of how like you know the ledger works and how um, like transaction tracking works as well, because I think that's a really important point. Um, because you know things I've heard brought up about cryptocurrencies and about about you know digital money is is you know government wants the ability to control all of your transactions. What better way than to have it all written down? But you know, like you're saying with China versus you know other countries, um, you know China they're they're issuing a digital uh, digital uh, I can never pronounce it pronounce it right yuan or yuan they're they're yeah. they're they're doing a digital version of that where it is based on a social credit score and it is tracked by the government, but like you're talking about, you know, Bitcoin is across the distributed network, right? It's all across the place and it's it's held by members, which doesn't allow a governing body to kind of, you know, put that type of control in on that. So yeah. I guess like looking at that, like, like, can you explain the, the ledger system a little bit and how, like, how all of that works and how it keeps it decentralized? Sure. So the concept that Bitcoin is essentially the first practical use of a blockchain in a broad scale. So, some blockchains mm-hmm. existed in theory till then, but essentially you have... Instead of a single computer that stores all the data, uh, let's say I'm a hacker, I can hack, you're, you're the bank, you know, I hack your one server, uh, I can get all the money or get everyone's private information or whatever I'm trying to hack, I have to hack one. So, so what if we had a network that had started at tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of computers across the internet, each with a duplicate copy of this ledger, and every you know, what they call a batch of transactions, essentially called a block, uh, mm-hmm. has to be confirmed by 51% of the network, right? So mm. if there's a malicious actor, it's built in. So if I attempted to use the network to do what's considered the, the double spend problem, like I have a Bitcoin or I have $1,000 and I spend it twice at the same time to game the system, that has a, a safety net to prevent that from occurring. Mm-hmm. Um, so that being said, though, no, there's people that have hacked individual wallets, like they've gotten passwords, they've hacked centralized websites that store data, but no one's actually hacked the Bitcoin blockchain mm. in you know, 12, 13 years, whatnot, right? The blockchain mm-hmm. itself is totally secure. It's probably the most secure computer network in the world, uh, and it's mm-hmm. totally decentralized. There's probably Bitcoin miners on every or, you know, nodes, as we call them, in every country in the, on the globe. They kicked them out of China. There might be some uh, hideaways hiding there, but, you know, with VPNs. But what, know. What's a miner for people that aren't familiar with that term? Good. So we compare Bitcoin to gold as a currency, right? So you mine gold or mm-hmm. silver. Uh, you don't actually mine it, of course. You have a computer that uh, runs a complex program that's used to secure the network. It runs cryptographic um, algorithms, basically. So complex mathematical algorithms that secure the network. Uh, and essentially those computers, new Bitcoin is created at its exact pace. There's going to ever be 21 million made. Uh, and mm-hmm. then it rewards uh, the computers that essentially solved the, the program, the, the problem, right? So by maintaining mm-hmm. the networks, those computers get a reward. They get some new Bitcoin as it's created. Oh, interesting. So they get like a percentage of that basically for, for creating it? Yeah. Well, essentially a little bit is created. That goes to whoever solved the problem. On, on a broader basis, there's massive networks all over the world that essentially even out their risk. So if you're mining for a certain amount of time, you're going to get a certain amount of Bitcoin. It's, mm. it's a randomized thing, but you essentially can even it out, you know, your expectance, how much you're going to get. Well, we've we've concentrated a lot here on on Bitcoin. I'm really enjoying this, by the way, Alex. I think we've we've, we've hit a lot of. There's a lot of interesting threads to go down this. So, so you know, if, feel free to bring me back to the middle if you need to. But I'm just very interested in a lot of directions this could go. So we've focused a lot on on Bitcoin, but there's so many different um, different ones out there. I know um, there's Ethereum. There's um, 
and I don't even know if it's a real thing, but Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports likes to say shit coin. So I don't know if that's making fun of it or if it's an actual type of coin. Yeah. So how do like like how many different types of, of cryptocurrencies out are out there and like how do we know, you know, this isn't investment advice, but how do we know like which ones we should be like investing our money in? Well good. So let me just tell you I'll answer the question. You'll see why the term shitcoin was created. So right now there's 16,000 <laughs> cryptocurrencies that have been created. That's a lot. In fact, there's 16,000 that are measured on a website called Coin Market Caps. So that means there's 16,000 that have bothered to go through some approval process and get a filing. So, um, you know, there's, again, this turns into like a bit of a political spectrum on the subject. Some people are like only Bitcoin and some are like, you know, no, we need this other. Uh, I'm somewhere in the middle. Well, I'll say that. Probably 90% of those coins out there, I mean, out of 16,000, maybe 99% are total garbage shit coins. Mm. Uh, if you have, ask a diehard Bitcoiner, he'll tell you that everything that's not Bitcoin is a shit coin. And there's even okay. jokes about it online. You know, I, I'm buying a house. Oh, that's a shit coin. You know, it's like, okay. But look, and it also like, you know, there's speculation, especially like since 2020 with all that extra money, some of those coins popped a thousand times, you know, so... Some people go out and speculate, try to find a coin that's low and get lucky and gamble on it going high. Uh, so I'd, I'd call those shit coins. Some people take the term uh, endearingly. So they're like, yeah, I'm, you know, there's even like a, a website called, I think, poo.com that measures like <laughs> coin metric or poo coin uh, actually mm -hmm. measures a bunch of these new coins. But, um, you know, Bitcoin was created as the first really cryptocurrency not exactly the first cryptocurrency, but as far as practical use that many people are using, it was the first cryptocurrency. Uh, there was sure. earlier attempts by some people that actually developed it, were part of the development team, something called, I think, digital, actually digital gold or digital cash um, by a guy named Nick Sabo, I believe, a couple of years earlier. But first application. Then Vitalik Buterin created Ethereum around 2015. There are other cryptos as well, but just to give you a kind of picture of where most of them stand. Yeah, sure. The idea like the kind of the big players in the space. Yeah. The idea with Ethereum was that he wanted he was actually working on Bitcoin and he didn't get approval to do it, so he started his own. But the idea was that you could use this blockchain, this the blockchain again, it's a decentralized computer network. It's called a blockchain because every like bunch of transactions gets fully confirmed, becomes a permanent record, it becomes a block. Permanent trans mm -hmm. uh, permanent transparent record and one goes after the next so it's a chain of blocks or blockchain mm. ethereum mm. was the first major blockchain now, bitcoin's the name of the blockchain and the digital asset or the cryptocurrency ethereum's the name of the blockchain technically the name of the crypto is actually ether but everyone calls it ethereum uh, mm -hmm. it was designed to build things on top of to be like basically an advanced like a platform sort yeah. of like like your mix and match platform yeah vitalik had the idea that finance wasn't the only application of blockchain that you could basically build the next evolution of the internet so mm -hmm. um on that that's where probably most of the sixteen thousand coins are actually tokens on ethereum and similar competitors there's probably about 10 i would say viable popular competitors that people have built blockchains that they felt are more efficient or more for a specific use. Uh, one of the most popular reasons uh, for blockchain or popular uses uh, is called decentralized finance or DeFi. We could build uh, mm -hmm. essentially a network that would allow people to stick their coins in there. Uh, other people would use that to borrow money. Other people would lend money, right? And they could get interest. So the idea of like basically a bank, except you know, a bank gives you 0.01% interest if it's Chase. And on your credit card after a year, they charge you 25% interest. And yeah. going back to Chase and the banks, Jamie Dimon got a 230 or $225 million bonus last year. Uh, the company made somewhat of billions, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars. And you're getting 0.01%. You know, you maybe make like, if you're really rich, you might have like $5 in your savings account by the end of the year. If you're like a wealthy person. So like there's no sharing concept. So the idea of a more fair, decentralized community approach where money is made, but it's shared by people. So you loan out money, you get like 8% interest on cryptocurrencies. There's one kind of cryptocurrency wow. that's very popular. Yeah, for that. It's called a stable coin. It actually holds the value of a dollar. Uh, one's called US dollar coin. There's another US dollar tether. There's other ones built that are actually 
pegged to the dollar, some by having dollars in the account, some by actually like having another cryptocurrency tied to it. But basically, mm -hmm. instead of having dollars in the bank, you could be like, I don't want the volatility of crypto, but I've got a chunk of change here. I'm going to put it here and I'm going to make 8% or 10% per year uh, of those coins. So that's a popular use case. Uh, another very popular use case, you can cut me off if I'm going on too long. No, no, I was just going to say like, like that, that return is, is just wild to think about it because I know like, you know, I'm thinking back to when I was like, you know, 13 or 14. So we're, we're talking like, you know, well over decades ago now yeah. at this point in time. And, and I remember like looking at, you know, uh, you talked about Chase Bank. I, I feel like I have a hate, hate relationship with Chase Bank. Yeah. Chase Bank. It's not a love hate. It's a hate, hate. Yeah. Um, but I remember looking at certificates of deposit at the time and you had to put in your thousand dollars. You had to lock it in for a year. Yeah. And I was like, I could get 1.34%. Or if I locked in for 18 months, I could get 1.41%. Yeah. Like, like, dude, like that was off the chart. So like 8% is like, especially when we're looking at interest rates and stuff, or like we're looking at, looking at now, like that's unheard of. Yeah. And so there's uh, different ways in crypto, but there's even centralized services that are basically like a company that does hold your crypto for you. And they loan it out to big corporations but instead of keeping 90% of the money, they keep like 20%. So they give it back. So that's how they're able to give interest. Uh, and then there's other ways you could literally connect your wallet into a protocol, basically give them your liquidity, lock it in a similar way, and you get mm -hmm. all the interest. There's no centralized service. That's called decentralized finance or DeFi. That's a popular way. And there's certain applications. It's called uh, Stacks is one of them. Uh, Sovereign is another one that are applications built on Bitcoin that do that. And there's many more applications that are built on Ethereum. Uh, so there's that. So I, yeah. So, well, the, the thing I want to bring us into here a little bit. So like there are all these different types and, and I guess the, the, the thing for a lot of people listening, like maybe they're new to this, maybe they're, you know, super fans of this. Like, you know, I, my, my, I know my good friend, uh, Dr. Jason Dean that listens to the show is like, he's obsessed with this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, how do they know, like, you know, what to put their, their dollars into? Like, how do they, how do you decide like, what's a good investment? It seems like, it seems like Bitcoin's kind of the one that's been around the longest. So it has the most trust. Um, but like, you know, what, how do we know what to put our money into? It's a great question. And I'm not a financial advisor, but I will say this. This is not financial advice, but <laughs> the um, you're going to see risk and reward go together. Uh, right now, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, which is usually very bad for risky assets like tech stocks. And right, we were at point two five percent. They just raised to point five percent, and uh, the Board of Governors, one of the one of the guys, was just saying like. You know, really, based on where inflation is right now, we should be at a minimum of 3%. So, like, we could yeah. see some stuff change very quickly. Yeah, so I see that, you know, once that hits, I think it's been going down for a while, which is kind of good from an investment point of view. You want to get it cheaper. But if you're new, I would get used to it first. I would get some Bitcoin, get some – I wouldn't touch anything that's not like a major top 10 crypto. You know, Bitcoin mm -hmm. is preferred. You know, there's uh, Ethereum. Uh, there's a few others. But I would stick to one of the major ones and get a little bit, be willing to lose, you know. Um, mm -hmm. There's more speculative activities. If you want to do something very risky, you're really willing to lose all of it. Those are the ones that you might put that kind of money into something you expect to go up 10 times if the market explodes uh, or, or get in. You, you know, there's trading on exchanges. Some have, uh, you know, certain fun funding rounds. But to keep it simple... Uh, I would stick with getting some Bitcoin and learning more. These are volatile assets. Uh, long term, I am a Bitcoin bull. I do think it's going to go up to half a million dollars this decade uh, with wow. what federal banks are doing, you know, central banks. Um, you know, that war is never a good situation and, and short term, you can never really predict what's going on. So there are ways of like learning technical indicators uh, for trading, but uh, when you have other things going on, like a war or, you know, oil embargoes, like that's something you can't really, um, you can't really predict what's going to happen tomorrow. So that makes it very risky. So I wouldn't try, you know, me personally, I'm not trading right now. Uh, I've only, I'm holding on to what yeah. I plan to hold for the next 10 years, uh, et cetera. Wow. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that being said, well, you, you mentioned the war. I think the thing that's that's really interesting right now is, you know, 
the economic warfare going on is is a lot bigger than I think people realize looking at that. And the I don't know if you go down this this path that I tend to go, but I, I, I tend to watch a lot of what the World Economic Forum's doing and, and you know, our space cadet Klaus Schwab. And I'm a, I'm concerned about you know watching the economic system and where it's going. So, you know, you look at Russia being cut off from the SWIFT system. You look at all these companies saying we're not going to do business with Russia. Um, and this isn't saying I'm supporting Russia or whatever it may be. I'm just using this as an example. So it's it's interesting to if if basically if a country or a person or or whatever gets debanked, like what do you do? I feel like that this actually pushes us more towards decentralized system because i think it breaks down the system we currently have because it's like well if if this person's not in it or this country's not in it well why would this other country want to be in it or i think it breaks faith in the system what, what do you think well it certainly breaks faith in the u.s dollar system uh, it, it has two effects first of all mm-hmm. you, you know i'll touch on it lightly but not go too down the rabbit sanctions either sure. work or they don't it's a simple one way or the other uh, they work if if you exert more pressure on those being sanctioned than, you know, in, in this case, like, can the Russian people, can you exert more control on them than Putin can? So if, if you think... And you know what's interesting about that, though, too, is, is, is like, and in, in, though, though Russia is supposed to be debanked, uh, some of their sovereign wealth funds aren't actually sanctioned. So they allowed a uh, $12 million debt payment to go through last week, which was just a simple transfer from uh, J.P. Morgan Chase to Citibank. Right. So at the same time, like, do they mean it, you know? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like oil was the last thing that got sanctioned, which if you're going to sanction, you really want to target the Russian army, you would immediately sanction that and embargo it. And Germany and Italy are the biggest buyers of Russian oil, and they have not, to this date, to my understanding, uh, stopped, right? So... Uh, the main target seemed to be the Russian people. Um, anyway, I'm not going to get into too much about my thoughts on it. I'm definitely not pro-Putin. Right, right, right. Also, I just, it's definitely a rabbit hole. It's a rabbit hole, but sanctions either work or they don't. They work if you can exert more pressure than that unit or individual is trying to exert. Uh, whether that's going to work to actually mm-hmm. pressure Putin to stop the war, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's going to create a short-term... And, you know, but I don't know, uh, certainly the, the, the leaders in Western countries either didn't plan that correctly or they messed it up on purpose. But that's another subject for another day. Uh, but the embargo yeah. on <laughs> was implemented in, in, I think, 1963. So that's an example of sanctions that do not work. Mm-hmm. Like that did not break uh, the chains of communism in, uh, was that, 57 years? That's like three generations um, that's a joke, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so back to the financial system, financial censorship, it does two things. One, if you see everywhere, left, right, and center, money is being financially censored by governments, you're going to look as an individual, whether you have anything to do with truckers or Russia or Ukraine, or if you look, they actually declared martial law. They also shut down their banking system, right? And then you have... Uh, you know, so if you're Ukrainian or you're Russian, you basically can't use a credit or a debit card anywhere. So if you're in Poland, you're not sanctioned, but you're probably freaking out and be like, well, maybe I should check out this Bitcoin, right? Maybe yeah, I should get a wallet and hold my own money. Mm-hmm. I know Russians, I know Ukrainians, I'm in touch with them, you know, on Twitter. Uh, it's In Russia, you're getting sanctioned on both sides, right? So if you, if you say that it's a war, you get 15 years in jail. Right. At the same time, if you say you're Russian and, you know, on Western media and stuff, it's like, well, you're you're in favor of the war. So, uh, you know, you can't go to McDonald's. You can't use Visa. Your cat can't enter the, the cat competition. Uh, you know, it, it, it's getting ridiculous. Right. Um, so, yes. So that is not effectively stopping the Russian army. Now, will that that result in, in mm-hmm. a widespread uh, civil war that topples Putin. Um, it doesn't look very likely, um, but, you know, uh, I guess we'll see. Now, okay, so that does two things. I told you about the individual outside of the system is freaking out. People in Russia that have Bitcoin right now that have it all, they can't buy it and they can't dump it. They uh, can't, the first thing they did when it looked like everything was going to shut down is they bought dollars and they bought Bitcoin at re- record high levels. And they withdrew rubles from their ATMs. Mm. Things that right now, if you're Russian, you can only withdraw a certain amount. You can't withdraw dollars, and you can only withdraw rubles and only a small amount. Yeah, it's like $10,000, which yeah. is 
kind of been our limit as well here in the U.S. for a long time, where, where yeah. Homeland Security kind of does a little report on you. Well, I think it's much less than that, not just a report. I think they're out of cash, actually out of physical cash, right? So okay, uh, similar happened in Lebanon, not because of any sanction, but the gov- the banks went insolvent, so you could only take out fifty dollars worth of of their currency, and their currency collapsed. So you're 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 screwed either way. So if you have crypto and Bitcoin and you, you, you're you okay, like if you're Russian and you need insulin right now, you're toast. Like you can't get it because it comes from Europe. So uh, I'm not sure what's mm. going to happen. Uh, some other countries are uh, probably going to be opportunistic about it. India didn't join the sanctions. They've been traditionally an ally of Europe and, and America, but they've got a huge economy. They probably say, hey, look, there's 200 million people that want to buy our products. We've got no competition. Uh, same for Saudi and United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, very conspicuously refused to take the president of the United States phone calls. They spoke to the president of Russia instead, and they did publicly state they would consider taking the Chinese digital yuan to buy oil. They've only accepted U.S. dollars for oil since Nixon took it off the gold standard, right? So the U.S. has had that Mm-hmm. That's, that's why it's called the the petrodollar. Right. It's one of the one of the reasons that keeps our standard of living so high, even though we don't produce as much as we used to produce because our our money is the reserve currency. Right. So that threatens that system. Also, if you're a foreign country, you're investing in bonds, uh, and you might get sanctioned and lose that. It makes it less attractive as an investment. Right. Like if you are a bank that holds Bitcoin, you hold twenty people's Bitcoin. You have fights with three of them and you take their Bitcoin, it doesn't make me want to give you my Bitcoin to hold it. So, um, so it, it weakens the trust in the dollar system. It opens the, the door for a positive of people fighting back and, and opting into like a Bitcoin economy, which would need to be really circular. Like normally you buy Bitcoin on like mm-hmm. Coinbase. It's really like similar to a bank. It's a centralized system. They can seize your assets that can block your transactions, but you can also get it on your own wallet like we talked about before. So in a place like Russia, mm-hmm. that have to be enough people that are like, I'll accept Bitcoin, I'll give Bitcoin, they just they can go wallet to wallet, phone to phone. So they have Huawei cell phones now. Chinese phones are the only ones they can buy um, in Russia. Oh, man. Right? So China moved in, made a huge oil uh, coal deal with them, and they're basically building a separate replacement to SWIFT based on the Chinese central bank's uh, system, right? So that builds, uh, opens the door for an alternative system, you know, kind of giving thoughts to like a longer term Cold War where like Iran, North Korea, Russia, and, you know, it looks like India is more on the side and the Arab, you know, Arab countries would kind of connect up. Uh, There's a lot of African countries that are allied with China, uh, you know mm-hmm. Venezuela as well. That would create an it was through the whole Belt and Road <laughs> through the whole Belt and Road initiative that they're going all through China, all through uh, uh, Central Europe. They're going through Africa, and they're kind of like setting up a lot of their stuff. Alex, can you give me two minutes? I have to use the restroom so bad because this is my second cup of coffee. So uh, my my editor Joseph will cut this out. Just give me two minutes. Okay, man. No, he's taking a break. Shouldn't be much longer.
right. Thank you for your patience, good sir. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, it's one of those one of those <laughs> moments where you're like, my bladder is so big, I can't even can't even stand up straight. All right. Um, so uh, we, were, we were talking about um, what was that? There's one important point I want to make in the U.S. Right, we. we kind of mentioned before the interview the idea of like government regulation and what's going on with that right um it's important uh you know i kind of take a middle ground on it. it's important for the existing you know industry uh companies in the crypto industry to educate regulators and enlighten uh legislators mm -hmm. uh there's a whole campaign going on to a good friend of mine paul mcneil is actually uh working to get every single congress member and every single Congress candidate educated about Bitcoin. And he does this like pretty much, I mean, not full time, but that's his, that's his main drive. So uh, it's important that we have in the U.S. we have a history of, you know, uh, kind of at least better than other places of free market. Uh, we discussed some imperfections with the banking system in that subject. It's not really a free market, right? But in general... Yeah you know, regulations that are light touch that give basic rules and get out of business's way have been a winning way in America. And uh, there's a good thing, a bipartisan, one of the only bipartisan things in Congress is crypto. And the other one, I guess, is daylight savings time, uh, which <laughs> they, uh, they approved a thing on daylight savings time. But aside from that, well, uh, well, well I guess. It, mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, aside from that, crypto is one of the few. Well, I was going to say like uh <laughs> You know, it's it's kind of you know left and right across the board, and unless you're Elizabeth Warren, you know she just wants to, to, to take everything and keep it as her own. Most people but I, under. I, I don't know if you saw a couple weeks ago. The uh, I'm sorry, I think we have a little bit of delay, so I apologize if I'm cutting you off. Um, there was an executive order from uh, Biden, I think about two weeks ago, and it didn't really do anything. It was more of like an advisory thing of like what he wants the different agencies to look like. Um, how do you think the the the, the government's going to react to like regulatory stuff with with cryptos now? So the few points that I answer first, I want to say uh, so the executive order was pretty mild, like you said, no big surprises. I think that is the best news you could you could hope for. Uh, it's pretty much uh, in this administration, you see really um, you know impartially looking like it, it's mainly the work of administrators, right? So uh, President Trump did a lot of things on his initiative. Uh, I would say President Biden uh, operates mainly on the advice from his, his uh, you know, department heads and so on. So I think they did a good job of coordinating and of seeing like, okay, uh, here's what's happening. Uh, I think it was a really good thing that China went out and banned Bitcoin. Uh, it's bad, but it's good that the U.S. on both sides is pretty much... Uh, organized kind of against China, so to speak. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that kind of put the Americans to a counterpoint. It's like, look, this is technology. We don't really understand about it. We need to learn more about it. And I think, you know, in Congress, this is blockchain caucus, which is bipartisan uh, and is focused on light touch regulations, which has traditionally been winning in America. It's popular policy. It's mainly been in the Republican Party focus, focuses more on kind of light touch regulations, uh, you know, a good balance. So I think, but both sides have kind of agreed on it. The people under 70 years old tend to understand what's going on, especially a lot of the millennial uh, Congress men and women are more focused on, let's do something good for America here. Because you can make regulations so tough, they stifle innovation, and people aren't just going to work through it. They're just going to move out of the country. That's what they're going to do most of them. So it's going to hurt uh, innovation if they get too tight in the regulations. So I think Congress is pushing for very light regulations. I think it was good what the president did. Uh, it was really, again, no big surprises. Uh, he pretty much laid out mm -hmm. what the government was doing and at least put something there in writing. So that's at least a guide, right? Uh, the thing which is most yeah. concerning... Yeah, it seemed like more of a executive fact finding than an executive yeah. order it wasn't really like yeah, yeah it's kind of like hey you guys look at this and report back to me type of thing yeah so they have a few months to complete some studies right uh one thing that's already ongoing which they mentioned was the u.s version of the central bank digital currency um 
which kind of has more of the, uh, you know, uh, the crypto community is less excited about that. Um, so I think uh, that's okay. Uh, I think what Congress is doing is good. Uh, the current uh, SEC chairman, Gary Gensler, I got to say, I have some negative things to comment on. Um, he's definitely pro Bitcoin, which is good. Um, I think the regulatory approach they're taking seems to be the exact same approach Elizabeth Warren is taking, which is like they seem to be fully funded by the big banks. Um, Gary Gensler, Janet Yellen, Secretary of Treasury, Elizabeth Warren are all, uh, well, not Elizabeth Warren, but Gensler and, and Yellen, they work for banks. They come from banks. You know, Gary's nickname mm-hmm. in, in crypto. Yeah, and, and, and Yellen especially is a, a dangerous character, in my opinion, as well, because, you know, she's a former Fed chairman that's now running the Treasury. Like, to me, that's a, that's a pretty scary thought. Yeah, it's like being the coach of the Eagles and then becoming the coach of the, the Giants. Like, you know, it, it's like, what, right? But anyway, whatever, that's apparently, it's not illegal. But the thing is, they both have received a lot of money from banks. They're in the bank's corner. So even if they try to be impartial, the fact mm-hmm. is, they come from that tradition of banks. A lot of uh, U.S. Uh, t- two companies that offered interest that were centralized companies, but they offered like 5%, 10% interest on crypto actually cut off their services to the U.S. because uh, one of them got a $100 million fine from the SEC. It was actually $50 million from the SEC, 50 from states. But the company's called BlockFi. They're in New Jersey. Wow. And they got hammered by the SEC. They actually agreed to it. Um, so basically, then they're reopening the product just for you know accredited investors. So multimillionaires can still get that interest we were talking about. But regular Americans cannot. So this is to protect Americans, but in reality, it's really to protect the big banks. So <laughs> I'm very against that. I think those in Congress understand that because they're most of those on that caucus are in their 30s and 40s, uh, and and have actually expressed pretty heavy criticism. Uh, Representative Tom Emmer uh, is, is a Republican, and he chairs the, the co-chairs the caucus with the Democrat. They have actually issued letters to Gary Gensler very critical of that and and critical of the fact that there hasn't been a Bitcoin, what's called a spot ETF, which is basically a financial product that's based on the current price of Bitcoin. Uh, That's been rejected time and time again. They approved what's called a futures ETF, which is basically a gamble on the future price of Bitcoin. So uh, which essentially devalues over time. So um, those members of Congress have been critical of the current administration's SEC, what they're doing. Uh, so I think work needs to be done. I think it's important that uh, it's looked at as an issue in this election and the next election for the purpose of, you know, protecting actual protecting Americans and having giving them the ability to access the technology and also protecting American, uh, you know, uh, competitiveness in the digital space. Uh, we have to have light touch regulations, and I think more and more. Candidates our age are realizing that and are stepping up. I, I actually uh, connected on Twitter with Jane Adams, a uh, really dark horse candidate from Las Vegas. She's a Republican, who's a moderate Republican, and she's like the only candidate on either side talking about crypto. She's been holding Bitcoin and crypto for years. She's a small business owner. You know, Vegas got smashed by, you, you know, the, the COVID and all the government closures. So uh, and you have in that situation incumbent, similar to you know, what you have with, with Senator Warren, where they're kind of comfortable. They've got that candidate hasn't even campaigned in 10 years. There's some 70 year old Democrat incumbent. No one's primaried them. No one's really run a good enough campaign to even force them to campaign. They've literally not even tried. They just keep getting reelected. So she's going to try to, uh, you know, work on both sides to get more people into it. There's a lot of people our age who are becoming a larger and larger voting block uh, that see crypto regulations as an important issue uh, and, and light touch regulations and protecting American innovation and competitiveness is a very important issue. So Jane Adams is one. There's probably a few dozen others. There's even something uh, called the HODL pack. Like it's I think Thomas of- Massey has been, been pretty, f- I think he's been pretty friendly with it as well. Am, am yeah. I correct on Thomas Massey? I haven't seen specifically, but it makes sense. I see his tweets. He's very much, uh, libertarian and against government spending. So it makes sense that he would support Bitcoin. 
really also from the Second Amendment point of view of like the citizens should have the right to protect themselves, uh, he'd be very strongly in favor of that. Mm-hmm. Well, Alex, I, I want to bring us to a, a couple more things, too, um, just because I know we're running a little bit low on time. But, um, you know, one being um, this is just a question I've always had, like, you know, cryptos are great. Um, Bitcoin is great. But like, what if the Internet goes off? Like, that's always been my question. Like, what happens if it shuts down? Like, are we back to seashells or like, how does that work? You know, I think if that I, I thought about that and, and my first thought is that if that occurs, you were not going to be worried about the price of Bitcoin. Uh, take some sort of solar <laughs> yeah. away, and we all have dead. So you wouldn't really need to worry about how much money you had. Uh, I guess at that point, your next ammo would be a gun and some bullets, so you can shoot some wildlife and, and survive another week if you are alive. <laughs> but, uh, most likely, that occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it is recorded on the blockchain, so um, you know you could you could build the internet back up. You could put it back online but I, I think most likely an event that would wipe out the internet would would wipe out most of the population so we would be worried about that yeah well the other thing too is you mentioned light touch regulation um and you, you kind of hinted to a little bit of what's going on in canada and some of these other places um and um you know we we have justin trudeau who seemed to be a very mild guy but then turned out to not be such a mild guy um talking about uh they were going to um, be putting like uh, transaction limits and stuff on Bitcoin and, and preventing people from using cryptos and stuff like that. Like, I guess, how can the Canadian government do that if it's something that's supposed to be like distributed and not under government possession? Like, how can they say, well, you can't even use cryptos? Well, they didn't know this when they said this, apparently, because they actually uh, attempted to subpoena data from a wallet provider, which is a decentralized wallet. Uh, if you have a, a mm-hmm. company like Coinbase, they hold your private key. They hold your password. They can, it is centralized. It's like mm-hmm. a bank. They can, they can, it's actually their Bitcoin. They could say, hey, you know what? The IRS wrote us a letter. You mm-hmm. owe the money. We're, we're, we're freezing your account. So that is what they were talking oh, that's about. That's interesting. But if you've got your own Bitcoin and your own possess, you know, you have the password. It's a decentralized wallet. Nobody can stop that from going through. Uh, they they sent a letter mm. to this decentralized wallet provider and got a very uh, direct answer back, uh, telling them that by design they didn't uh, collect any information about, about users except for their email. They have no idea how much Bitcoin they have or when they used it or where they are, and uh, it's by design. And when the Canadian dollar goes to zero, we'll be here to service you too. So it was a pretty uh, stinging answer. Uh, and that's the case. So with decentralized wallets, you're in control of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is a concern about using a centralized service that can be forced by the government, you know, at gunpoint to turn over your data. It's I've been talking about it on Twitter with some other folks, but it's like the difference between can't and won't, right? We could say, well, we won't do this to you, but you can, if they can be forced to do it, then it's better to set it up so they can't do it. So if you have it, on, it's a bit more work, but if you learn, get it on your own wallet, self-custody, as we say, self-custody your Bitcoin. Uh, no government order can do any. I mean, they, they could arrest you. They could take your body. But there's even a, a man who was arrested a few years ago in England. Uh, and they said, hey, look, uh, give us your private keys for this $27 million. You know, you stole it. We, we want it back. And he was like, nope. So as we say, you know, not your keys, not your, you know. Bitcoin. So not your keys, not your cheese, as we joke. So uh, if you have it that way, they can't get your Bitcoin. Well, I guess just looking at the perspective of you mentioned um, um, in the uh, executive order, there was the idea of exploring uh, like a Federal Reserve digital currency. And I think that the, the, one of the things they were talking about last year is uh, is believe it or not, I actually watched the uh, press conference for it. it was for the Fed Now system, which is uh, like the Fed digital system they're setting up. And one of the things that I've been watching too is uh, uh, Christine Lagarde, who's currently at the um, the European Central Bank. Um, she used to be at the IMF before, so anything she touches, I'm kind of like terrified of. You know, any any lawyer that works at a bank, you should really be worried about them. She's looked at introducing a uh, European uh, Central Bank currency. Do you see more of these like banks trying to move off of cash now to like compete with cryptos, or, or how do you think that works? Well, it's interesting because in a way, most currencies already digital, right? Like, 
Sure. I, I don't even remember the last time I used cash. So whether it's PayPal, it's really numbers on the computer. So to a degree, we already have a digital currency. <clears throat> Central bank digital currency is an interesting concept because it goes back to the idea that a country, if it has a central bank, can control its money supply. And that's a key point of government control. Um, you know, in a moderate way, I'm, I'm basically totally against any concept of a central bank digital currency whatsoever. Uh, in almost no use cases do I see, you know, you know, in some cases, okay, if you're in an African country, you've been manipulated by the IMF, you want to create your own central bank digital currency, you have a way of taking control, you'll still be the one in control of your people, but you'll at least get rid of a, an external oppressive uh, bank. But other than that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anything to make some sort of enhanced central bank digital currency that will be for surveillance and so on. Imagine like, okay, there's a pandemic, next pandemic. Uh, so you get your, your stimulus check, but then it's like, oh, well, you didn't, you know, you're supposed to register this and register that and, you know, make sure you're, you're taking your meds and make sure you're, you're voting for the right political party. And if you don't, uh, you know, we're actually going to take your money or, Hey, there's, you know, we're going to, we didn't, we weren't able to pay, you know, the government bills this year. So what we approved is that we're going to take 5% of everyone's money, a bail in like they did in Greece, right. In the last couple of decades. So, um, I'm very, one, one of the things that's, that's really concerning to me, and I guess it's more on a local level on that, Alex is, is they could be like, well, Mr. Laura's, you were speeding yesterday, and we took two hundred dollars out of your digital bank account because you were definitely guilty. Like those are the things that concern me is is that level of control yeah. because it is centralized versus decentralized. Yeah, so uh, that's where Bitcoin offers a way to opt out. I think that's going to happen anyway, and I think most people mm -hmm. will have their their bank with a little bit of operating cash, and they'll have their Bitcoin as their savings. That. You know, yeah. on a private wallet, hopefully, where it can't be touched or some de decentralized service. It might hustle something where it's like a centralized service, but it's in like a different country that, you know, uh, but some way to, to hold your, you know, an alternative version. You can have cash, you can have Bitcoin, you can have bars of silver, and you have your central bank digital currency, which uh, is going to be a necessary evil for some transactional things if you can't find someone to just take Bitcoin. So, I think in the end, mm -hmm. innovation, technology, and freedom always wins, uh, even though it can be a long road. So I think it's important we educate as many people as possible at Bitcoin, the idea of actually democratic finance. And most people, most Americans yeah. strongly uh, fear and would be against a central bank surveillance state on any, any, because no matter who yeah. you are, no matter what your political beliefs are, the moment you become you're going to become unpopular at some point. People on the far left and the far right, it doesn't matter. They, they, they don't mind their opponents being surveilled and censored, but that's eventually going to flip around. So they're not going to want it to happen to them. So I think it's yep. a bit of a strong enough deterrent that both sides politically will be strongly against it because they could see how it can be, how it can be levied against them. And I think in recent events, I've seen more mm -hmm. people on Twitter on the far left and the far right agree on, on this on than more than any other topic, like very far left progressive people going, wait a minute, you know, this guy who's a progressive Bitcoiner, he was like, if, if politicians you love could do this to people you hate, what makes politicians you hate unable to do this to people you love? Think about that for a minute and realize it's true. If you're allowing human rights to be removed from somebody you don't like, it's going to happen to you eventually. So Let's wake up. It's yeah. not worth it. It's not worth the short term political struggle over, you know, what budget figure goes in or if we build up, you know, welfare, or the military, like it's not worth losing all your human rights and your ability to live. I think 90 percent of Americans yeah. agree on this and why it's such an important issue to like lay off the Bitcoin, let it roll. Uh, if they're going to go with some sort of Fed dollar, central bank digital currency, I think rely on it as little as possible. Uh, whether you're uh, far right, moderate, progressive, don't care about politics, uh, you just want to be left alone, uh, it's something that you should consider, again, not financial advice, but life advice, look, it's something you should consider learning about. And same way, you know, you prepare for emergencies, you should have some, some Bitcoin in case you're going to need it.
Mm-hmm. Well, Alex, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. I think this was a, a, a lot of interesting threads to be followed. And I think we're, we're going to leave people with a lot of different areas they want to look at. And uh, for those listening, if they want to connect with you uh, and follow you, I know you're, you're writing a medium, you're, you're producing a lot of content on Twitter. Where's the best place for people to find you? Yeah, you can go to the latestblock.com, sign up for the uh, subscribe for the newsletter that comes out every Tuesday. Uh, you can also follow me on social media. We'll put the links down there under my name, Alexander Loris, and the, the latest block. Uh, you can also check out every Wednesday, I write the column for the Quantum Economics newsletter, quantumeconomics.io. Sign up for the newsletter there. And uh, I'll be seeing you online. Very cool. Well, Alex Loris, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, man. Absolutely, man.